All right, welcome everybody to the New Jersey Youth Soccer Legends Series. Today with us, New Jersey native Yael Averbush, uh, US Women's National Team player, 26 caps, and a remarkable career, 15 years as a pro, a very respected player. I had the opportunity to watch Yael play uh, for the last 15 years and uh, definitely a, a sensational football player, somebody that's uh, loaded with skills and somebody that uh, um, always is the first person to promote practicing at home. And she's gone as far as developing her own app, which we will go into a little bit later on. But first, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about you and um, your upbringing and uh, more importantly, um, Tell us where you were born and that and how you fell in love with the game and what type of things you did as you started to fall in love with the game, things that you did at home uh, in order to build a, a foundation. Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, I'm, I was born in Montclair, which is where I grew up, um, and neither of my parents were soccer players. Uh, they were both lifelong athletes in, in mostly long distance running and things like that, but knew nothing about the game. And so growing up, I didn't really know anything about it until my friend in school uh, was playing. And so I thought, oh, this looks fun. My best friend is playing. Let me sign up and try this soccer thing. Um, but really quickly, I, I enjoyed it right from the start. And I think just my personality is one that whatever I get involved in, I want to learn all about it. I want to try to be my best. So very quickly, I remember right away after my first practice session, my dad and I were like, what are these long socks for? Like, what gear do I need? We were already researching stuff. And, and very quickly after, we started to buy these um, VHS tapes on like soccer training. And we still actually joke about some of them because it's hilarious. Now there's so many resources out there for players, but we would order these VHS tapes from soccer catalogs that had like drills and moves and turns and I would write them down I would stop and start rewind watch it again write them down and I would go and practice them because to me and the way I was kind of raised is like if you're participating in something you should want to be good at it and that means that you're going to have to you know figure it out kind of in part on your own so right from the beginning I kind of had this mindset that I credit my parents with a lot that you know, if I was going to do this thing, I was going to learn how to do it. I was going to practice it. And so then when I showed up uh, with my team, it was even more fun. And I thought it was really fun to do that. So I kind of remember very early on, I said I wanted to be a professional soccer player. I had no, I don't know where that came from in my head, but I think I heard some of my friends in school, some of the boys I knew said they wanted to be baseball players or basketball players. And so I said, oh, well, I play soccer. I'm going to be a soccer player. And I told this to one of my early coaches and he said, well, do you know how to juggle? And I was like, well, no, what's that? And so right from the start, he was kind of the, one of the first ones. I was like, well, if you want to be a professional, you got here, these things you need to learn. And so that kind of started me on a path of understanding, whoa, there's all this stuff I can be doing and that I need to be learning and mastering if this is really my goal. And from that point on, I was always, um, from the very start, spending time with the ball on my own, keeping track of my juggling records, crossing them out on my little paper in my room and writing my new ones. And I, I mean, I, I still love that stuff. I love keeping track of improvement. I love making a training schedule and sticking to it and cross checking off my days. So that was kind of like my whole experience in the game had to do with a lot of the things I did on my own. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so, so when you, so you obviously built the foundation on on juggling and and foot skills and and stuff like that. I've seen some of your your videos and uh, you're a big fan of the wall. Uh, talk about the impact that just the wall had on your game. Yeah, I mean, I, if I think about it, I, I wish I had um, a parent or somebody who could have just driven balls back and forth with me, just like being kicking with me all the time, but not many players have that. And even if you do, you know, my sister became my great training partner over the years. And even she didn't sometimes was busy or couldn't come out with me. So the wall basically is your most reliable teammate. Um, you know, the wall never says no, the weather, it never doesn't come out if the weather's bad. Um, and it's always there. So I, I would go to this, I don't know where this idea came from because I didn't really know much at the time and there weren't all these videos out there, but now looking, I know a lot of, um, a lot of top players will credit that they kick the ball against a wall or 
like we're always doing repetitions of striking the ball. But I didn't really know. And I remember going to a schoolyard uh, kind of near my house with my dad. And that's when it kind of started. And I would go also in the winter into a racquetball court and use the wall just to practice like passing technique, striking the ball. And a lot of times actually, because I was a very, I said was, I shouldn't use the past tense. I'm a very intense person. So sometimes I get frustrated and angry and the wall was quite often where I would like take out my anger. I would strike the ball as hard as I could, right foot, left foot, just over and over. And um, it just, for me, it's really enjoyable. It's almost like meditation. So certainly a, the best training partner you can find. And it always has great feedback too. If you play a crap pass, it's gonna come back to, at you in the air. So, <laughs> so yeah, the wall has been a great friend of mine. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, so, so you you obviously got some ideas from the training videos that uh, the VHS training videos, uh, they were hilarious. I agree with you there. Um, but when you went to the wall, um, you obviously used to just make up stuff, right? You weren't you weren't like just transferring stuff that you saw in the video because not there wasn't a lot of at wall videos back then. So you went to the wall and you just made up stuff. Um, tell us some of the things that you remember making up and do you still make up stuff? Cause it looks like you still do. Oh yeah. All the time. I mean, I think for me, training is a lot about imagination because when you're on your own, you're trying to replicate things that will happen in a game or maybe have happened in a game. And so for me, it was always, um, making up things that felt like, oh yeah, this happens. So I remember there was one point a teammate actually showed me if you bounce in a certain way, you can practice like a jumping header. Like otherwise on your own, you can't practice he heading the ball. It's impossible. Or, um, you know, if it bounces a certain way, I could practice side volleys like over and over again. So I would, I would constantly just be messing around and figuring out something that said, oh, that feels like something that's happened before. Let me get some repetition of this. And so always like I, I got a lot of wonderful ideas from watching these, these videos. And I had great individual coaches I worked with when I was younger, but a lot of it did come up where I was just, messing around. I knew I was going to spend 30 or 45 minutes out by the wall and like things come up. It bounces a weird way. You try to strike it differently. You all of a sudden you're, Oh, let me see if I can bend it with inside outside. Like there's unlimited things you can do. And I always kind of, um, I laugh when I hear players say like, Oh, well I ran out of things to do, or like this was too basic. And I'm thinking like, even if I was just playing with the inside of my foot, right foot, left foot, like you can always get to a new level as a player and feel that it's sharper, smoother. You're hitting the ball with different pace, different spin. There's like so many things you can do. So my imagination was always going crazy and it still is. Um, even in developing like training resources for players in the app, they have like, I'll, I'll go out to film five things and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, well, what about this variation or what about this one? And I think that's one of the most fun things of training is coming up with all the different variations. You're going to be a, a, a fabulous uh, coach one day if you ever take it serious and actually uh, get on the field and train a team because uh, for me, that's the, the best part about it where you're able to create things. So you go from a kid creating things individually to creating things for, for, for teams. So that might be in store for you one day, Yale. Oh, I don't know. Well, I never thought of it like that, but that actually sounds very appealing. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens. I mean, you know, that's why I don't, you know, I've got no interest in, in like, I love learning, don't get me wrong, but the, the biggest thrill is, is, you know, looking at your, your, your players and your team and creating something that's going to stimulate them kind of thing, exactly like we did as kids. So, um, so, so a lot of stuff with the wall you did, what about, what about like taking players on? Like, like what would you do to, you obviously the visualizing thing, you know, running, across a field and imagining there's a whole bunch of people there and you're taking them on and, and, and so on. Like what did you used to do for, um, for long range passes and for taking people on and even for shooting? Uh, how did you come up with stuff um, to get better at that stuff? Yeah, I think that's even more challenging is to do some more of the game realistic stuff that takes bigger spaces. And I remember always trying to recruit people to help me. So even like my dad, literally never, never played a game of soccer in his life, but he would be my defender. And we'd make like a small grid where I would have to keep the ball. And we would do something where like, even if he touched the ball, it would count as a point for him or something. Or a game where he would actually have a tennis ball and he would try to throw it and hit, hit my ball. So I had to keep it moving really quickly. 
Um, so we would come up with things. Um, we would, used to joke that he was a world-class defender. It's like still our ongoing joke. I would dribble at him and he would like try to do something. And I mean, I would make the space I had really narrow. So obviously we had to, we had to make up rules to make it even, but we, we found ways or any time I could, if there was a coach or anyone who wanted to come early to a session or stay late or meet up and hit longer balls, I would do that. Um, and, but a lot of it still though, I did kind of in isolation. Like I did a lot of shooting with repetitions on goal with no goalkeeper and with no defenders, but I would like pretend there was a defender and kind of faint if there was a cone or something and then work on placing it as if there was a goalkeeper. So um, when I could get a goalkeeper to train with, amazing. If I had my sister, she was like, became a really good 1v1 partner, a little too good. And then I had, then I got scared that she was going to beat me. But, um, but uh, you know, I, I think it's like, I would recruit the people I could to help, but then still a lot of it was imagination. It was striking long balls against the wall, like as far back as I could go and trying not to hit the one window by the school <laughs> or get in trouble if I hit um, and all of that. So I think, um, you know, I did the best I could and there wasn't, wasn't always somebody to do those things with. So uh had to had to certainly make things up as I went. Now your 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 app, which is a, a fabulous uh, at home training tool, um, is a lot of the activities that you that are in the app um, have they made it from when you were a kid to into the app? How many of them are actually have made it? Oh, all of them. Like it's, of them. I, I joke with my dad. I'm like, dad, we made an app because we, we made up all this funny stuff. And actually some of it um, is actually named as what we would call it. Like I remember I uh, one time somebody told me that Tab Ramos showed them this footwork pattern. And I don't know what to call it, but it's in the app and I call it the Tab Ramos. But yeah, or like, uh, you know, my this guy who was a few years older at one point showed me this other dribbling thing and his name was Wes Kirk so I have the Wes Kirk move in the app and it's like <laughs> these are like the ways I refer to the moves I don't know their names but like as a kid I learned it from Wes Kirk so it's a Wes Kirk move uh so really the app is like uh I mean I use this is like what I do to train um and so I basically tried to build something that was what I would have gone crazy for as a kid it's what I did as as a young player and it allows others to use it and track their progress and to compete against everybody using it. So it's, it's all from, it's all uh, genuine, <laughs> genuine content. <laughs> yeah. And um, you, you compete against people from all over the place, right? Can you compete against people from the other side of the world as well? Yeah. So anyone using the app uh, is on our leaderboards. And so it's pretty cool. Some days you'll see people from literally uh, Australia, we have Saudi Arabia, Netherlands, Sweden, people from everywhere and all over the US, um, which I think is one of the coolest parts I didn't really foresee is like how it's connected people, especially right now when, you know, people can't play in person, it's a good way to connect with others who are doing the same training. That's awesome. So you mentioned um, your dad a lot. Um, I've had the opportunity to meet your mom and uh, she's always uh, been involved in the game and always willing to help. I notice and She's, she's such a sweet person. Um, so how much of a role did your parents play apart from um, your dad coming out on the field? Like, like how were they uh, supportive of you emotionally behind the scenes? Yeah, I mean, my parents, uh, I knew at the time, but I look back now and I realize even more how, how wonderful they, they've been through all this. Um, they started me off with a really important mindset I think of like chipping away a little bit each day at what you do and that was always just what I thought was normal it's like they did their workouts every day even if it was snowing I would wake up to like my mom jumping rope in the living room or something crazy like so, um, so I realized now like how not normal that was but how important it was to my development but also you know I mean the emotional roller coaster when you really care about something like I was so serious from such a young age and I cared so much and I I see this in the past tense but like I'm not quite removed from it still like I I really care about the things I do so they saw a lot of tears a lot of anger I mean I I credit like I can strike the ball pretty hard and I think probably like 80% of it is from my level of anger when I was practicing sometimes. <laughs> um, so my poor parents, like I look back and they probably at times were a little lost, like, oh gosh, what do we do with this kid? But I mean, they, at the end of the day, they were always looking to make sure that I was okay and I was enjoying it and that I was, you know, doing things for the right reason, which is always important because I was, 
I was so focused on these goals and sometimes it's, it, it's scary and hard to know if you're making the right decisions. And they kind of always helped to guide me as much as possible. But at the same time, it was my, it was my decision. Uh, they never pushed me to do anything or, um, or like they were not, uh, they were kind of helping me along, but they weren't steering the, the way. Yeah, that's funny you say that because all the interviews so far of the successful players that I've interviewed, uh, it's all been uh, the parents have allowed their kids to to steer and they're kind of guiding. So let me ask you a question. Um, let's just say you had a bad game and you got in the car. It never happened. <laughs> <laughs> all right, shall I change the question? <laughs> no, it happened, it happened too many times. <laughs> yeah, so... So what, what was your mum and dad's approach? Um, would, they, would they nitpick you? Were they angry? Or were they still super duper supportive? Oh gosh, I think they were terrified to know what to say because they knew if they were supportive and said, oh, you know, that was okay or not so bad, then I would come back like, no, what are you talking about? That was terrible. Because I was already so hard on myself. Never. I mean, I could maybe count. I don't even think it would take up one hand to count on the amount of times my either of my parents ever tried to offer a critique or anything. I mean, they, one, they, they aren't soccer players. So very few players, I think, growing up actually have parents who know, like, as much as the coach or more. And some now, some more so now, I think. Um, but also, I think, you know, especially for a kid and a player who's, who's going to be hard on themselves and critiquing their performance already and disappointed, like, the last thing you need is to reinforce that. So I think my parents were like, tried to steer maybe to another subject or see if I wanted to get ice cream or something like anything away from from the subject um but that certainly happened many times I mean I was so hard on myself and so cared so much that like if anything wasn't great I was going to be upset about it for a while and I would want to go out and practice more and that's just kind of my personality so I certainly didn't need them to say anything on top of it and they were kind of like okay whatever you need to do I think they were they probably dreaded that more than me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Final question on your parents. Um, was there ever a time when your mum or dad and, and you looked at each other and said, uh, wow, I've got a really a true chance of making it. Like when, when did you know that um, there's a possibility that you could go all the way? No, oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think that because of where I grew up and the mindset of my family, I kind of all along had this understanding that if I did the right things and continued to work hard and, and did this right, that like this could be reality. I never started off with a dream thinking like, oh, this dream is meant for someone else. I thought like this dream was meant for me. Like if I, I had all the experts around me to help and I, as I gained a better understanding of what it took to, to do that, I understood like, this is going to be a lot of work. There are going to be these ups and downs. So I think I had a really good and healthy perspective. And I never thought that I was doing, you know, it's funny. This is actually kind of a personal thing I'll share. I have uh, recently since like stepping away from playing and having a lot of health issues, I've gone to a lot of therapy to like help me talk through some of this stuff. And my therapist, one thing he talks about quite often is like the difference between your, um, your aspirations and your expectations and i laugh when i think of it because like i always tell them like i have no there's no gap for me like if i have an aspiration my expectation is that i'm going to meet it like why would i have a he's like yeah a lot of people they have an aspiration and they don't actually expect to to meet it and i was like what are you talking about like to me if i'm aspiring to do something i always expected i always knew that i could do it um, and actually, I think the older I got and the closer I got to like being the player I wanted to be, um, it became more scary because uh, the, the potential starts to run out. Like I had this dream of being the captain of the national team and like doing more than I accomplished, to be very honest. Like I wanted to play in an Olympics and a World Cup. And the older I got, the actually that was when I started to say, oh, I might not make it to exactly what I wanted to be. But like as a young player, I always thought, if I do the right things, then this could be me. Like when I watch players on TV, I wanted to be them. And I was like, I can do that. That's awesome. Um, which kind of leads to my, uh, my next topic. Um, so your aspirations and expectations attitude, I like that. Um, so a little bit um, then about your mentality. It sounds like uh, just growing up, 
you didn't look externally at what others were doing. You were kind of on a mission just to, and like you said before, a little bit better every single day. Was it, was, was that, is that clear? For, is that, is that how you see it? Uh, yeah, certainly. I mean, I, I'm a human. I, I was really jealous of other players at times. I would, at, I, I remember as a kid thinking like, well, I'm working so hard, but like, what if someone out there in Texas or California is just like so much better than me? So I was always looking and comparing myself and I would see other players who could do things I couldn't. And I would, you know, try to mimic that. So, I mean, Yes, I think my focus always came back to like the things I could control and the part I enjoyed, which was what I felt like I could impact on my improvement, which is the little stuff every day. But certainly like I, I, if I wasn't starting on a team or if I got cut like from, from an ODP thing or whatever it was, I, I took it really hard and I would like think about the other players who made it. And I, yeah, I, I was like, I was really competitive still and definitely took things very personally and got jealous and all the normal things that go along with, with caring a lot. <laughs> All right. So just staying with the, uh, uh, the mental aspect, um, obviously, you, you know, you've played amongst, uh, so many good players and, and, and your career, you, you played all over the place. You, you've, you've kind of bounced around a lot. So you would have, um, had the luxury of, of just seeing so many players. How important do you think, uh, mental toughness really is to be able to play at the highest level? Oh, I mean, it's, I would, I was going to say it's everything, but I think here's what it is. It's like, there's a basic amount of ability you need, not natural ability, but ability physically, technically, tactically, like all of that. But that is the starting point. And then the mental part is what makes or breaks everyone, in my opinion. And I think the biggest thing that I realized over the years is it's the longevity. Like you have to have a constant thing to go back to continue getting better because it doesn't matter how good you are at any single point. Others who are getting better will always pass you by. So I think what I realized is one of my most valuable things as a player was that I was able to keep improving even till like the end of of playing professionally is there were still things I was always looking to improve. And I think that's one that makes it fun and exciting still, but also like as a player, you never should get past that point. And once you do, you're, you're going to stall out basically. Well done. Well done. I love it. So, so you went to UNC, um, you, you, you know, you were a, a, a star player in the, in the area. Uh, I'm guessing you were being recruited by um, a lot of colleges. What made you pick UNC and what, um, what was the picture like uh, in your head before you went in? And when you got there, what was different about the picture that you visualized? Oh, these are great questions. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I, I mean, from the time I was a young player, I always, my goals were I wanted to play for the U.S. national team and be a UNC Tar Heel. And those were kind of, to me, as a really young little kid, it was like one in the same a little, because at the time, a lot of the national team players did come through UNC. It was like, uh, you know, when they say the dynasty, it was really for many years, um, not as, not as even a playing field as it is now, where there are many top programs. And so, but when it came time to actually pick a college, um, I kind of, I looked at a lot of the top schools. I'll be honest, I did what they tell everyone not to do. I only was looking at the soccer program. I didn't care about anything else. Um, and that's, but that was my mindset. I already had the mindset of a professional player in the sense of like the other part didn't matter to me. I knew I would be happy if I was, felt like I was getting better and I was playing at a top uh, program. And so it came down to, I didn't really want to go to any of the schools, to be honest. I, I was terrified of college. I didn't want to, I didn't really want to go. I didn't want to move away from home. Um, and then I felt like if I went anywhere besides UNC, I would always wonder what if I went to that dream school as a kid. And if I went to UNC, I'd probably never think that about the other places I was looking at. So I kind of like very reluctantly went there. And I, I guess I thought I was going there purely as a means to an end. Like I have to pick one of these colleges and this is the best program I think for me to like make me a better player. But really what changed about the picture was that I ended up there meeting a whole group of, um, of wonderful friends who took their playing as seriously as me and who saw the game the way I saw it. And so for the first time in my whole life, I had friends who like really understood me. 
Um, I didn't have to be embarrassed about going out to the field late at night or in the racquetball court. Like I had six people along there with me. So um, it was a really, I think it was a great time in my life. And I ended up loving everything about it. I loved Chapel Hill. I loved the social part, the, the academics, um, everything. But I really did not go there with the intention of experiencing any of it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like an amazing culture. Yeah, no, it ended up being wonderful and I loved it. And this is still like my, my lifelong friends I made there. Um, but definitely wasn't what I was thinking about first and foremost when I arrived. <laughs> right, right. That's awesome. All right, uh, just a couple more things. Um, ODP. Uh, you grew up playing ODP, uh, correct? Yes, yes, yes. I loved ODP. <laughs> yes, so, um, so out of our... The four people that I've interviewed so far, three didn't make it the first year they went out. Where do you sit on that? And how was your experience? Uh, so I did make it the first year I went out, but ODP for me was, it was a really exciting thing because like I mentioned before, I was always wondering like what other players are out there. Cause I was so competitive and I was like trying to be the best. And I understood like if there are all these thousands of players in New Jersey, you're going to have to be one of the best to then compete against the, the best players from all these other states to then try to be the very best. Um, so for me, this was like the beginning of my exploration into like who's out there and what's going on. So it was both exciting, but also like terrifying. Um, and I think now I look back and like, I remember uh, the tryout processes and, and how it was going with the team to region camp and like the whole process of being part of ODP for me uh, was so valuable because it mimics everything you're ever going to have to do if you want to be like a top, top player. You have to show up with a new group of players who you don't know, play whatever position the coach tells you to play and prove yourself. Um, and so, oh, it's so scary. I like feel scared when I think of it so, but in the best way possible. So I had a very good experience, but I never felt uh, comfortable or like I knew I was going to make anything. And it was always every year, every training session even was always like a new challenge to prove yourself and, um, and see who was out there. So, so it was a good gauging opportunity because it gave you the opportunity to gauge where you sit and then it just exposed you to um, just different players. Sounds yeah, like. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, different players and different coaches and, and different challenges for sure. That's awesome. Okay, last question. If you could go back and relive one moment, what Ooh. is it? That's tough. Uh, wow. Um, I think for me, you know, you know, what's funny is that when I have an answer that I'll share in a second, but when, when I think of that, I think of a lot of moments that like, aren't that important, but there are so, and there's a lot of them actually, like the stuff at the wall, like playing in my family, just hanging out or things like that. Like to me, uh, they mean a lot to me. Like they mean as much as any championship or like bigger moment, but um, my senior year at UNC, um, we, we won the national championship. So I got to win my last ever college game. And I remember there was one, there's one moment in the game that was like a really important moment to me is that that year I was really, I was practicing free kicks all the time. So I would show up to training every day early to practice free kicks. And a couple of, um, like Tobin Heath and Casey Nagara now Casey Lloyd, always wanted to come with me to the field and they didn't have a car. So I'd be so annoyed because I'd have to go pick them up every day. And they'd be kind of fooling around, like doing tricks and stuff. And I like wanted to do reps in my free kicks. Um, and but this is happening all season. So I picked them up every day, all season. And we would play this free kick game where we'd try to hit the little red flag in the goal. That was like, it was like the quick goal thing that's right in the upper corner. We would see if we could hit the red flag. So anyway, I, we each had spots that we, had mem we, we knew were our spots. And in the final game, I think it was 1-1 one, one maybe or something. And then uh, we got a free kick and it was Casey's spot. So I said, Casey, go. And she scored. And I remember, I don't, I'm pretty like, it's very hard for me to celebrate goals like all out. I never get like too emotional in the moment. I lost it. I was crying. I was screaming. And then after the game, actually, a few weeks later, I got a card from Casey in the mail with a little, with the red flag from the goal, from the, uh -oh. I think she That's took nice. it after the game. I don't know what happened, but it was like a little quick goal flag that I still have. So for me, that was like a, such a special, um, a special moment as somebody who really spent a lot of time as an individual, 
like to do that with my teammate and to feel the success of us all together because we worked on it together was like one of the most special moments of my career. I think. Oh, that's awesome. I actually watched that game and uh, you guys celebrated like crazy after the game. I remember that. Oh yeah. And I never, I never do that, but I was like, <laughs> I lost it. I just totally lost it. <laughs> well, listen, mate, uh, absolutely fantastic to talk to you today. Uh, thanks for your, your, your insight. Um, you know, you're doing wonderful things for, for all the kids around the world. Keep up the, uh, the great work and um, seriously think about coaching teams at some point. I, I reckon you'll be amazing at it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I'll, I'll consider it. My uh, working on technique football is a full-time job as of now, but I'll consider Thank you, James. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, we'll talk. Huh? Okay. Thanks so all much. Right. Thank you.